pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we appreciate your presence tonight. And thank you, Lord, that you made yourself known, that you sent a prophet who gave us the truth and told us what we needed to know for the end time, a bride waiting for the revelation, the rapture. And he gave it, Lord, just shortly before he departed this earth the way you wanted to take him. And we're grateful, Lord, that all things have worked out for our good, even though we were like the disciples who could not understand why it would be necessary that you went away and you did and it was necessary or the Holy Spirit could not come and do the work that he was supposed to do. Now even at the end time we know that there must be a work done by the Holy Spirit working through the word in our lives and the prophet had to go off the scene because his ministry was over and judgment must now set in. So we understand these things and appreciate it all because we have insight and with the insight this great knowledge, Lord, we can worship you in spirit and in truth and we thank you for that. Now help us in our studies tonight that we may further know the truth and come even more thoroughly to an understanding and a, and a solid rock uh, understanding, Lord, to where we have a tie post which is absolutely um, unmovable and we immovable with it, Lord, and, and, and become strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus at this hour with the word of the Lord having its place in our lives and we becoming more and more the word which we actually are but in the negative we want to come more and more to the positive and with your help we will in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated <clears throat> now just before we go into the study again from on godhead i want to read you something that i talked about uh, the other one of the messages and it had to do with uh, a statement that a person made, and I can tell you uh, exactly who that person is, and I'll read it to you. Dr. Elmer M. Nelson, the second head of the FDA, tried to block health food processors from comparing the quality of their products with their synthetic, or you know, that would be their uh, engineered uh, products, their counterparts. He said in testimony in federal court that it is wholly unscientific to state that a well-fed body is more able to resist disease than a less well-fed body. And that's what this man said. My overall opinion is that there hasn't been enough experimentation to prove dietary deficiencies make one more susceptible to disease. Now this guy is an unmitigated lying hellhound deceiving antichrist what about scurvy what about berry berry took limes and they got better <coughs> this is the stuff it's in the world today science so-called you cannot turn around but lies 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 why money 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 the intrinsicality of the soul of man is money, money, money. Now, let me tell you something about what's happening. They're falling in their own trap. The farmers in America will soon lose a $12 billion contract with Japan over engineered soybeans. They're turning them down. And Europe won't take it. Now, I won't quote my source or the pharmaceutical company. But I've been given to understand a certain pharmaceutical company <coughs> using soybeans uh, for their mash or their broth, what they were going to feed, whatever they're feeding on to get their drugs. Something wasn't working. They made an analysis and found the engineered soybeans only had 50% of the nutrients the others had, and therefore what they were doing failed. And yet the other day I saw pictures of these rabid guys Oh, these scientists saying, no such thing as engineered food being bad, it's the best. They ain't knew they were lying. I'm going to tell you what, I know when I'm lying. I know when I'm telling the truth. Don't tell me they don't know. Of course, they ain't lying. An educated MD telling you that? then why are they worried about little babies not getting nourishment? Why are they screaming about little kids, little kids, little kids, they're poverty stricken, they, they don't have the money for food. Who gives a rip? Let them eat sawdust, they'll be fine. 
Now take that to the pulpit and see what you got. Ersatz. Man, I get so steamed up over, but I get steamed up over the word too. Don't think I don't get steamed up and happy and everything else too. But I just had to read this and <clears throat> see, I knew about it, but I didn't, didn't have the quote. Didn't have the man's name, but I got it. Fortunately, it fell into my hands. Fortunately, the other fell into my hands too that about the pharmaceutical company. And they're going to say, oh, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. That's why the herbs and things don't work. We're getting irradiated herbs. The Europeans are, are not taking our engineered grain. If you don't believe me, you go to the elevators around here and they'll tell you, what, is this engineered? Yep, beat it. We sell our stuff to Europe. <clears throat> well, but when you consider what the devil has told to the people, leading in worse the worship of God, I guess this is just child's play and nothing to even talk about. And I want to go to Godhead, and we're going to try to do some, uh, oh, talking about Godhead and uh, a few things, and I'm going to read a lot of quotes of Brother Branham. I hate doing that because when you take things out of context, it isn't quite right. You, you need to read a lot of context, but when you take enough quotes, you can sometimes bring a lot of things together that are quite, uh, you know, good, they're quite beneficial. <clears throat> now, to begin with, we know that uh, Brother Branham uh, talked about different times, God being called El, Ella, that's L-E-L, -E -L, and then Ella, E-L-A-H, and then El Ella, and then Elohim. And of course, like everybody else, he settled on the word Elohim. And uh, what it all boils down to <clears throat> is the uh, strong one bound by an oath. Now, so let's just work a little bit here. Uh, where are we going? It doesn't really matter what color we use, but <clears throat> we can start with blue up here. And uh, we can talk about, uh, yeah, here we are here. We can talk about um, getting this off with some, some sandpaper. <laughs> Sandpaper or something. <clears throat> but anyway, we have here, it's El, and then el -ah, and then Elohim. And, uh, you know, that's the strong one bound by an oath, so we got the strong one. And that's uh, uh, bound by an oath. So, <clears throat> what you really see here is actually um, uh, strength, and it's extra strength because it's omnipotence. And uh, over here, it's word, uh, actually, which is omniscience. So, <clears throat> when you find that God is bound by an oath, you find that God actually uh, is his own word. He's his own bond, he's his own word. And uh, see, that's over in uh, Hebrews, it is, I think, where it says that, uh, that Abraham, when uh, uh, God made uh, promise to Abraham, he swore by an oath, and since he couldn't swear by anybody greater, he swore by himself. <clears throat> and uh, Actually, uh, his presence was there uh, confirming his word. So you find that God is a confirmer or keeper of his own word. And uh, Brother Branham makes a statement where he said a man is his word, uh, getting this from God. And of course, this is exceptionally true as you look at the scripture because if we are a part of God, which we'll talk about every so often, uh, and God is word on the grounds of omniscience and omnipotence, he's bound by his oath, he's bound to his word, and his word is bound to him. Uh, you can see then that we also are our word, and uh, a man is as good as his word. <clears throat> well, if a man is as good as it were his word, it means that he's an honorable person, and he will discharge the responsibility 
of his word being brought to pass, whatever it is that, that he has said. So <clears throat> we find God up here who is, uh, who is actually uh, love, and uh, that's one of the three. And then we have uh, omnipotence over here, and we have omniscience over here. <clears throat> so we have actually all those, we have that's the great fountain of the Holy Spirit. And out of the great fountain of the Holy Spirit, uh, we have here coming up from down in this great reservoir, uh, God Almighty, um, uh, ma uh, revealing himself as to uh, the strong one bound by an oath. <clears throat> and um, you will notice as you study scripture that God never ever, as far as I can see or read in scripture, ever made a covenant uh, prehistorically with anybody except Jesus, his only begotten son. And only begotten means uh, uh, begotten uh, in a unique way, uh, no one before him and no one after him. He's that unique one, and he's the first one. <clears throat> and uh, you don't find him having a bond with angels. Uh, when there was a war in heaven, it is quite evident that the uh, die was cast when Satan uh, became iniquitous, which means he perverted the word, and the, uh, at least, what is about two-thirds or whatever it was, or the third of the host of heavens fell with him, and him they went into a perverted state. And you see, there was no contract there. It was, e it was simply, uh, you're here, and tomorrow you won't be here if you're off my word. You're in now, but get out. There was no contract, but when, there, when it becomes contractual, you have to know uh, what lies within the individual to bring out this contract. <clears throat> now, we'll show you the contract, and it has to do with man. The contract that God made with his son positively had to do with mankind, and anything else is irrelevant because it says in Romans, if God spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? So you can see right there <clears throat> that the contract with the son concerning the children of God who were begotten in a different manner from Jesus uh, is in play. And this is why you have the Jehovah complex come up out of the El 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 Elohim complex, but it's not changed. It now is that love, the spirit which is love, omnipotence and omniscience, <clears throat> is completely centered upon the children of God. And nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. Now you have to understand that. That there, anything else there is a matter of circumstances and convenience. And the circumstances and convenience are not about God. <clears throat> it's about the people. Because God can take, well, take care of himself. That's like the 144,000 are virgins and their attendants upon the bride. And they, they like, they're therefore in the, they're in the New Jerusalem. So, uh, but then, then all around them, the, the, the foolish virgins, the rest bring their glory in. And then outside of that, there's all the attendant angels and arch, archangels and cherubim and all the rest. <clears throat> but you'll notice that when, when the end time comes and the kingdom is handed back to the Father, he now is in a pillar of fire above the throne and before they call, he answers, and everything, of course, is devoted specifically, and then trickle down from Jesus, the New Jerusalem, and out and around about in yonder. <clears throat> so what you'll have here, and I have conveniently, my own convenience, uh, have done some little thinking and some little numbering, and in the Jehovah complex, which Brother Branham admitted, was God's 
nature and love toward mankind is what is demonstrated and what is here. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice I mentioned there's not, there was, as Brother Branham brought out, that, that there were seven redemptive titles, and it's not seven, because seven is not the number of God. Seven is completion. Three is the number of God. So you either got to have a three or a six or a nine or a 12 or a 15 or an 18 or a 21 or a 24. Well, forget it. There's nine. <clears throat> three threes. And that's exactly what is true. And now what I've done here, because I've, I've numbered these here, and it's going to be difficult. I'm going to do this over again here because I didn't give myself enough room down here. So I'm going to bring this bring this down here, coming up out of this, this great fountain of the spirit of love and, and omnipotence and omniscience, <clears throat> and it comes flowing up, and out of El -El Elohim, who is alone and inviolate, uh, who dwells by himself, who needs nobody, <clears throat> who doesn't have to have anybody, uh, who is, there's no God beside him. He's there, period. And he's there all alone with, with this great loving spirit that's omnipotent and omniscient, and he's bound by an oath. He's already bound by his own word. He's got to live up to what lies within him. And you can see now that he is actually powerful word, lovingly, giving of himself. That's what he is. <clears throat> so we shouldn't have any trouble understanding that. Now, <clears throat> way back in Jewish history, the Israelites decided that they would make uh, what actually is a logo, uh, you might say, or it's a, a figure whereby they could uh, immediately recognize the Jehovah complex of the uh, God's great love and uh, earnest intentions and uh, guaranteed word concerning them. So, all right, the first title I'm going to put up here is Redemption. Now, that's one that is missed out by everybody and sanctification. <clears throat> you see, God doesn't... It's not in seven. Seven is completion. What everything God does is in sevens. Huh? That's exactly right. <laughs> but God's in threes. <clears throat> now, the reason I take redemption as the middle and top one is because that's what Brother Branham talked about. Man left God in sin. And now God must buy back or redeem. And redeem means to buy back and put in its rightful place, completely restored to where it was and should be with all the benefits they should have had and didn't have, and now will have, and even beyond that. That's redemption. <clears throat> so number one, to me, <clears throat> has got to be redemption. Now, this is called the memra, what we're going to talk about. Now, notice how pretty that is. One, two, three, four, five. That's five letters, right? Now, the new spelling of it is menorah. The menorah. That's seven. Well, that's very nice, too. God working in sevens. <clears throat> but the actual number of the arms of the lamp is actually nine. So down here, we have a set of arms. That's two there. And that's four there. And we got... Uh, See, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we got a ninth one. <clears throat> now, that is symbolical, but in, innate. I mean, uh, not innate, because innate means inwardly, but it's, uh, it's not at all sensate. There, it's not alive. It is just dormant and standing there as a symbol, as a memorial. And as you look at it, you, you think about God, and you say, all right, 
uh, I am related to him in these nine ways. He is blessing me, this great God of love. <clears throat> so at the top is redemption because that is number one. Now going up there, that's the number, that's really is the, is the uh, one, two, three, four, that's really number five. That's a high point right there. <clears throat> so all right, now over here I put on number one, he's present. And so he's got to do something uh, to work with man. So what does he do? In redemption, he's got to come down and be present. He's got to be a kinsman redeemer. And he does that through Jesus and Brother Brown and explain. So then number two up here, I put that as the Lord is our righteousness. And he is our righteousness there. And then on, what have I got number three? Number three, I got our sanctifier up here. And then on number four, I got, oh yeah, there we top. One, two, one, two, three. Oh, we don't need that, okay. One, two, that's six, yeah. I got to have my one, two, three, you got four, four, four. Oh yeah, what four up here? We got to get a little higher now, don't we? Okay, what have we got for number four? Redeemer's the top. Now, I'll st I mean, I'm going to get these all here eventually, so don't worry about it. That would be number five up there. And, uh, okay, this here then would be, would be uh, peace. He is our peace. I think we got that, right? And then from down here, we would have, these are what I figure. I'm just talking what I would figure. He is our shepherd. He is our provider. And then he is our healer. And then he is our banner over us is love because that would be the feast of the trumpets, which is the last feast. <clears throat> so now we have here all of this beautiful fountain of God coming up here. And of course, this is, this is a candlestick, a very poor candlestick like this here. Now, <clears throat> that's what they had back there in the ancient times. <clears throat> now, when it came to the New Testament, and God worked out all of this redemption because God was in Christ, uh, you know, reconciling the world. God was in Christ uh, redeeming the world. And all of these here <clears throat> have to come through the one that God sent. And we went all through this different times as we followed what Brother Branham said. To, and and we, got, we got right down here where, where we see that <clears throat> the next step is going to be coming over here uh, from this here, which is simply the, the Memra into the Logos. <clears throat> now, the Logos is the word that, that went way back uh, to the time before John, I guess back to the time of the uh, uh, Old Testament put into Greek. They had a million Jews in Alexandria, and they had scholars by the scores, and, and they, they put out the Septuagint. They got the Hebrew into the Greek, and <clears throat> where they used the member there, they used the Logos over here. And this word Logos is a word that John was able to use. Now, uh, see, if you watch carefully, Brother Branham uh, did something which I did, and uh, well, he could do it, and I couldn't. Because he could easily, uh, and, he re and he did actually reword a lot of things, but <clears throat> he, said he oversimplified. And in the oversimplification, uh, in a sense of the words oversimplification, it's really not when you understand what he's saying. But when you take and say, all right, now, Logos is, is, the, is the actual exterior of, and, or the expression of what is in the interior, <clears throat> and the exterior has to be a part of the interior. And now, when you use this simple saying, which is true, a word is a thought expressed. Now, <clears throat> I don't have any trouble with that except uh, the English language. Now, if I use a word or words, I'm actually using a means of communication. And a word uh, 
will take on the meaning of a person, a place or thing, a verb, an adjective, an adverb. Uh, it'll describe location, uh, describe conditions, uh, describe uh, previous to present to future. Uh, we'll actually use words that analyze, come to conclusions, and uh, actually go so far as to delineate feelings, uh, motivation, and various other elements <clears throat> so that I could stand up here and draw you a word picture whereby you could instantly with your mind see every single thing that is not present and know every single thing about that and be absolutely satisfied that you have it. Now, you couldn't, you couldn't possibly <clears throat> think in terms of the word that we call word in the English language <clears throat> and associate that to God. You can't do it. So when, when it's simply said, uh, a word is the uh, a thought expressed, although it's very true, uh, where, where do you uh, really come to the understanding you should come to <clears throat> when you're talking about God? Well, of course, you're not talking about God when you use the word word in the English language. You're, that's a means of, of communication. I know that God is the great communicator, and no problem with that, but we're just talking in terms of, <clears throat> of just straight talk tonight, not just talking spiritually. But we get to the place where in the beginning was the Logos. See now, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and that is translated word, you are far beyond anything that we use in our common everyday language for word. Now the reason I'm saying this is because we got to be very careful <clears throat> about Rima and Logos and know how they actually interact. And you'll find that many people, like this one fellow, this guy from up in Chicago, his name was Olson, he was making a big deal about Rima and Logos and trying to let everybody know that, that it was in his own way that Brother Branham was all messed up and didn't, he wasn't the Elijah which was for to come. In fact, he told that down in Dayton in a very crude and vulgar manner, and that's why they never had him back anymore. He, that whole bunch finally found out what well, we knew all these years. The guy was absolutely <clears throat> uh, a satanic in his approach to this work. He had nothing in mind except to destroy Brother Branham and the ministry. Uh, he would go to Europe and say, I can't stand the thought of saying people in the message. Well, what, well, what are the in? Right. Well, I want to know something. See, this guy was a weasel in the chicken house. <clears throat> Boy, they went for him down in Dayton all around toward Lyme and the whole area, but finally he just bold, boldly told the people, look, if you believe Brother Branham is Elijah, you are so-and-so. It was a very vulgar and crude statement he made. <clears throat> well, I could agree with him, maybe. But anyway, they finally found out what he was. So this business then of Rima and Logos, it, what we're looking at here is you simply cannot just take and say word. It won't work because God is not just word. See, look at here. We, we have it all up here. <clears throat> Omnipotence, omniscience, all coming up in the form of his attitude and his heart's desire and the outworking of his heart's desire for his children. Well, come on. This is Logos. But this is just sitting there. It's simply a picture. Over here's reality. So now, here we are. And remember, they had reality too. See, they, they, no doubt about it, they had reality. But we're moving now <coughs> from what they call the membra, <coughs> that nine-pronged candlestick, and we're going now to an understanding which is the same understanding, but now coming to the Gentiles and using a Gentile language, which was the Greek language, even though the Bible was also written in the Aramaic. 
And you're going to find in the Aramaic, there's even some words that are better used in the Aramaic <clears throat> than in the King James Version. In the Aram Aramaic, where it comes to Timothy, where it talks about the elders uh, can only be, can be the husband of, of one wife, uh, right in there it calls it polygamy. That's what Brother Branham said, it was polygamy. Where, where the King James Version doesn't give you a clue, and you go haywire and crazy trying to figure this thing out, it's polygamy. And yet, how many people would have known, except I asked Brother Branham point blank, and he said, Lee, in my thinking, that's polygamy. You wouldn't even know that. It's not in the tape. It's nowhere. But the Lamb's subversion positively identifies as polygamy. <clears throat> so, see, so much for language. You've got to have revelation along with even what you are getting, which is legitimate according to language. So, all right, <clears throat> we have Logos over here. Now, I'm going to take a little time reading to you, and I hope I can get through at least this portion tonight. Reading from uh, Dr. Vine, who, of course, was a student of all the other students ahead of him. And uh, he mentions here in 1 John 1, which we will find that Brother Branham uses one way and then another way. In one time, he will say, if you make Jesus the Logos, positively you have three gods. And yet in 50, maybe to 100 places, he makes Jesus the Logos. And it's 100% right what he's doing. <clears throat> People just don't understand. And then many times he uses words, and he runs them right together, and they are nouns in apposition, which means they're the same thing. <clears throat> See? It's just like you say, the, there's a great thunderhead. There's a great storm. Well, thunderhead and great storm is, they're, in, they're nouns in apposition. But one clarifies the other. See, you could say a terrifically strong wind, or you could say a hurricane. They're in apposition. <clears throat> now, he takes a thought in the beginning was, and that's what you're looking at, with evident allusion to the first word in Genesis. Now, this allusion here actually is an allusion back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is up, form, and void, and so on. But John elevates the phrase, now listen, from its reference to a point of time, the beginning of creation, to the time of absolute pre-existence before any creation, which is not mentioned until verse 3. <clears throat> so, when you're looking at John 1 and 1, you're looking at a, a far deeper understanding of the beginning, and this has always been put forth by students, than in Genesis 1 and 1. And in verse 3 it says, there's nothing made but wasn't made by him. There's nothing made, it was all except by God. <clears throat> This beginning had no, this beginning had no beginning. See, now, he's, he's telling you right there that the beginning he's talking about actually had no beginning. The one before, there was a beginning. So, there's, he's letting you know that there's something here in John 1 and 1 that far supersedes what is in Genesis 1 and 1, when it comes to time and, and, the, and the place in time. <clears throat> so, since he's, he's back here in John, the third chapter, I mean the first chapter, in the one verse, third verse, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he's saying here, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning here, far supersedes anything that has to do with creation. <clears throat> this is actually something that is found in the Greek here. And in the, uh, well, we could go here also to uh, Ephesians 1 and 1. And he uses this as the very, the very same thought from the very same words And he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful <clears throat> in Jesus. And of course, you've got to read on there where it tells you how that you were in him chosen before the foundation of the world. So if you were there in him before the foundation of the world, this predates 
any reference to creation. <clears throat> so there's somebody here in a beginning, before there's a beginning, you'd say. But it's still a beginning, but it's much previous and much further ahead. And he goes on into Ephesians 1 and 4, according he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> and then he goes into uh, Proverbs 8 and 23, bringing these different ones out to let you know how this happened. He said, I was set up from everlasting from, ever, from the beginning or ever the earth was. <clears throat> That's wisdom. So you're, you're looking at John 1 and 1 here in a depth that is not in, in Genesis 1 and 1. This heightening of the conception, however, appears not so much in, that's the word in, beginning, which simply leaves room for it, as in the use of the word was, denoting absolute existence, see, instead of came into being or began to be, as it's used in the third verse and in the 14th, <clears throat> the word became flesh. This tells you that there was somebody way back there before creation. And that's what John 1 and 1 is actually saying. <clears throat> this is from the authorities that go into the Greek <clears throat> and they know the tenses and they're able to parse every sentence and tell you exactly what it all means. See? Now, Again, it says here, instead of coming into being or began to be, which is used in verses 3 and 14, of the coming into being of creation and the word becoming flesh. Note also the contrast of the word in the beginning and the expression from the beginning, which is common in John's writing. So you have one which was previous to the beginning and you have something from the beginning. <clears throat> so you got a beginning line, if you want to use that here, we got a beginning line here before John begins talking and there's something way up here and there's a beginning here. Now this is previous and this is after. <clears throat> so the Bible is very, very accurate in what we're seeing here. And which leaves no... now which is common in John's writing, and which leaves no room for the idea of eternal <clears throat> pre-existence. So in Genesis 1 and 1, the sacred historian starts from the beginning and comes downward, thus keeping us in the course of time. Here he starts from the same period, but goes upward. So that's what he's looking at here. See? <clears throat> thus taking us into the eternity preceding time. Now, he's quoting from Milligan and Moulton, who are very outstanding authorities on the Greek. And then you see in Colossians 1 and 15, and that's one we've used many, many times over here, uh, concerning creation. Philippians, Colossians 1, 15. Who, who, no, rather, <clears throat> here it is. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? <clears throat> so, the image of the invisible God... We're talking about Jesus, and by him God created all things. So you're looking at a period even before him. See? Now I can understand that. There's no big problem there. <clears throat> this notion of beginning is still further heightened by the subsequent statement of the relation of the Logos to the eternal God. The, lo is what the, the Logos must refer to the creation, the primal beginning of things, but if in the, this beginning the Logos already was, then he belonged to the order of eternity. <clears throat> so what he's saying here, if you have a Logos right here in this area of creation, it's, that wouldn't hold up in the Greek. It has to be the area before creation. You've got to be before. Then you find all this that happens down after creation starts, and Brother Branham took us through much of that. <clears throat> all right. 
The Logos was not merely existent, however, in the beginning, but was also the efficient principle, the beginning of the beginning. So he says here, the Logos was not merely existent, however, in the beginning, but was also the efficient principle. <clears throat> in other words, he's the one that was there all by himself and started doing this thing, whatever it was that's being done. So you could look at it this way and say, all right, uh, this Logos is merely something to do bringing us into a relationship and knowledge or visibility of what was already there and uh, we had no knowledge of relationship to or visibility. <clears throat> so there's something there. And that's exactly what we found right up there. See, in that particular area. See? The beginning... The Logos was not merely existent, however, in the beginning, but was also the efficient principle, the beginning of the beginnings. In other words, if he hadn't been there, nothing would have begun. And yet, when he was there to begin with, in the sense of standing all alone, we call that to begin with, in the sense there's going to be something come down, we could say before anything ever came down, somebody was there. See, somebody had to be there. <clears throat> The beginning in itself and in, in its operation, dark, chaotic, was in its idea and its principle comprised in one single luminous word, which was the Logos. Now, <clears throat> so therefore, what he's telling us here that John looked at was, no matter what you are looking at, no matter what is in the world, and no matter what predated the world and anything in it, there was Logos. There was this one. <clears throat> and he's called the Logos. <clears throat> and he's, that means he's called the Word. But you see, this is where I was talking about. I would have trouble in simply saying that a Word is an idea expressed. Because God is not an idea. <clears throat> it goes deeper and deeper. But this is the Word that John found better than Memra, <clears throat> or just a symbol. So he said, all right now, we're going to begin to unveil this God, and we're going to start right at the, uh, right back in the beginning, before there was a beginning. <clears throat> in other words, before there was a, an atom, a speck of stardust, as Brother Brandon said, a breeze, anything, God was all alone. <clears throat> the Bible often speaks of it as God in, in, in the darkness. Uh, this fellow here puts it chaotic and what have you. Nothing really there. <clears throat> but the, one, the thing that comes out now, according to him, which is luminous, which is bright, which is wonderful, is this thought here, or the idea, that as a word expresses a thought, so now, evidently, God is going to come in into whatever he was, inscrutable, unknown, known to nobody, because nobody's there, he's now going to start to come forth. <clears throat> so as God comes forth, it will have to be God illuminating himself somehow. And he cannot illuminate himself, even though he has the quality and ability, unless there's somebody to illuminate himself too. <clears throat> this is where you have the understanding now of Logos, or God, coming into what you might call the being relationship, which will be started with his son, we see that, and then coming on down, as Brother Branham explained it. <clears throat> and when it is said the Logos was in this beginning, his eternal existence is already expressed and his eternal position in the Godhead already indicated thereby. <clears throat> now, I want you to know, this guy is Trinitarian. That doesn't bug me one bit, <clears throat> because I know what he's saying is the truth, but he doesn't have the truth. He's a Trinitarian. See, he's trying to throw this Logos back onto Jesus. <clears throat> he can't do it. Even from his very words, he cannot do it, because sons have beginnings. And if son had a beginning, who is before the beginning? 
Huh? And who brought about the first beginning? See, he chops his head off. He's a nut. He's a heathen, doesn't even know. <clears throat> See, we know the truth. Now, he's quoting from Langy. Eight times in the narrative of creation, Genesis, it is said, God said, God said. Now, <clears throat> the word logos. This expression is the keynote and theme of the entire gospel. And it comes from several root words, and I've talked about them before, which means to lay. If the primitive meaning is to lay, that is to lay, lay something out, to lay there. Then it means to pick out, gather, and pick up. Hence, to gather or put words together and so to speak. See, now that's, that's okay. It's fine. And when you speak words and use words, you do it to communicate. And the communication is knowledge. <clears throat> and so God, in communicating himself, has this special way of revealing himself, even as the Bible said, the only begotten had declared him, which means to lead him forth by words and actually explain him. Hence, Logos is first of all a collecting or collection, both of things in the mind and of the words by which they are expressed. <clears throat> okay. Then all you got to say is, whatever is in here in God is collected in there and then is expressed. And that's what we're talking about. And it's the same thing here. What was in him, in him, as he was going to relate to his own children, was already there. And it comes up in the Jehovah complex, and at the top one, the fifth, is redemption. That's the high one. And this leads up to it, and this leads down from it. So you're going up to here, complete redemption, and you're coming down here, and you're coming, and then it comes back to God. Right? But sure it's got to come back to God. Because God becomes all in and all. And the feast of the and the and the, <clears throat> and the feast of the tabernacles is the last one. And it's and that's where they come together in, in, in houses made out of branches. It's a very temporary thing. Why? Because they're on their way to the promised land. <clears throat> and it's the eighth one. Meaning we're starting all over. <clears throat> now Hence, Logos is, first of all, a collecting or collection, both of things in the mind and, and of the word by which they're expressed. <clears throat> so you see, if you're going to express it, you're going to have to be perfect in your expression. Your words have to be perfect. That's why you can't add a word or take a word. Now that's where I said oversimplified. I tried to get people to see that Logos wasn't just what they thought it was. Like, for instance, now, if a man made a knife, you're going to make a knife, and it's a serrated edges and all, and a, you, know, you know what a knife is like. I, I'm not good at drawing knives, but a knife is, whoops, can't even draw a knife. Oh, well, we'll try something else. All right, we'll try a little knife, something. We make a little knife, something like this here, little handle on it, little teeth here like that. It looks more like a ladle, but it's a knife. Now, the point is, if, if, it, if, it, if, it came, if it came out like this here, that's a spoon. That's just no low gossip of the, of, the, of, of, of the thought of a knife. I oversimplified it to get people to know the look. <clears throat> it's got to contain, it's got to come out what is there. Amen. And if God's a low goss, then God's got to come out. He's got to come into view. <clears throat> now, if you don't think that's true, then why did John say, of concerning the low goss, then we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he's telling you flat, God literally manifested his glory through Jesus Christ, and Jesus got the glory by healing the sick and raising the dead and being a great figure, and God was doing it all along. Combination, a duality, <clears throat> one within the other. See? <clears throat> so, so I oversimplified it on purpose, and and I, I'm, you know, I was really sorry I did. And I, like I say, Brother Branham went so far as to just, you know, talk about, uh, uh, you know, being the word, being the word, being the word. <clears throat> and you, you come to the place where it's almost like saying Rima, 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 and it's Logos, and it's Logos with Rima. See? Because the Logos would have to contain the Rima. <clears throat> So that's where this guy Olson went, hey, where I try to separate. I looked in my Bible, I found case after case after case 
or, or Rima Logos. It's just like Jehovah Elohim. You can't say, well, one is, you could say, all right, maybe it would Benny Hinn. He got so messed up, he said there's three sets of three gods. I think he got it from this. Well, I could say, okay, here's Al, one God, two God, three God. Oh, good, we got three in a row. Fruitcake. <clears throat> you know, this, you know, stupidity is not allowed in the presence of God. You know, why? Because he will give you the answers and make you to know all things, see? <clears throat> so, it therefore signifies both the outward form by which the inward thought is expressed and the inward thought itself. The Latin or oratio and ratio compare with the Italian, the ragino, to think and to speak which it doesn't matter. These guys are always complaining, comparing Latin to Greek and it pains my neck. All the students have always gone stupid. They, they're so big-headed and so smart, they can't say anything sensible. They gotta talk around and make you think they know more than God. But I read what the idiot said anyway. <clears throat> Too bad, I mean, I'm, an, I'm a vulgar person, so just forgive me. I think he's a he, great guy, but what a mess. But he's, science, but he's pedantically right. As signifying the outward form, it is never used in the merely grammatical sense as simply the name of a thing. See what I'm, that's what I'm talking about, or an act, but means, but means a word as the thing referred to. In other words, you're not simply talking about something, there's a reality. <clears throat> now you, you could talk about um, Gulliver's Travels, that's a myth. But if you talked about Marco Polo, that's not a myth. See, there's got to be something there that's real. <clears throat> the material, not the formal part. A word as embodying a concept or idea. So it's not that. See? See, for instance, Matthew 22 and 46. So we'll just see what he says in Matthew 22 and 46 to help us get, we, we already know this, but we'll see what he's saying because he's going to the Greek for us. <clears throat> and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now the idea was if David then called him Lord, then whose son is he? And it, it, what I looked up here, let me see now. I get this. Uh, 22 and 46, yeah. And he said, uh, and what he's, what he's talking about, he was signifying the outward form, it is never used in the merely grammatical sense as simply the name of a thing or act, but means a word as the thing referred to, the material, not the formal part, a word as embodying a conception or idea. And it said right here then, <clears throat> no man was able to ask him a word, and it, 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 it said if David called him Lord, how is his son? And so this is not just merely a technical question. It's a question that has to have an answer, which I say is deep within it, and at this point would require a revelation. So you simply don't, you're simply not asking a question for the sake of a question. You're simply not bringing information for the sake of saying something. There's got to be something, in my understanding, what he's saying is something very, very definite, <clears throat> something very, very pertinent. Now, he says, um, also down here, is further use of discourse, either the act of speaking, that's his word, logos, the skill or practice, the continue speaking, this is in the Bible now, also used of doctrine or of narrative, a matter under discussion. <clears throat> so the Bible uses this word logos in different ways. And when it does, in referring to God himself, <clears throat> you have to go far beyond what is just uh, a definition and you have to go into the philosophy. And the philosophy was, here is God from the Memra put before you knowing in three threes with the full redemptive quality, which takes you all the way from being alienated from God, a sinner, not a reprobate, not a child of disobedience, but a sinning, disobedient child, all the way, God coming down, taking all the way up here and all the way back. See? Now that's what we are looking at when we are looking at Logos. Now, <clears throat> therefore, having understood this, is it possible 
that you can attribute to Logos in John 1 and 1 anything but God himself. Now, don't get all messed up in your thinking as to how God did this through the Son. Because remember, there was no creation till God birthed his own Son. And thereby, God birthed himself as God. <clears throat> See, as Brother Branham said, in him, here, let's bring this down here. Now, in here, in him, and this is him, was to be father. In him was to be son. In him was to be Holy Spirit. <coughs> In there. <coughs> now, you will notice that this complete plan from here all the way back again, God is all in and all, and everything in him now comes into full manifestation in the human race, and whatever he wants, and these are the redeemed, he all is in Adam, all died, even so in Christ all are made alive, and in him was to be father. He certainly was. <clears throat> in him was to be son. How did he do it? Very simply, he came and indwelt the son, and in the Holy Spirit, how? He came and divided himself upon the people. And yet, remember, God is a person. God is a person. He not he is not omnipresent. He's only omnipresent by virtue of his omniscience and, om and omnipotence. And if you know everything and you can act on everything, you don't have the omnipresent. <clears throat> You're automatically got it. Yeah, otherwise, that's pantheism. That's that old junk day down in Florida, you know. I wave my arms. I wave through God. I breathe in. I breathe God. I breathe. Well, I'm never going to breathe out again. I want all the God. I want them go <laughs> you talk about, come on, this is the junk they're preaching. It's the same thing they're preaching right today. They're saying that God, they're quoting Brother Branham, and Brother Branham is not saying what they're saying. One guy, he takes these three tumblers, and he said, okay, this is God, this is the Son, this is the church, and this is full of water. He pours into the Christ, throw away that. All right, he pours into the church, throw away that. That's not what is said. Amen. That is not what Brother Branham said. I'll get quotes on that and show you. <clears throat> no, 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 no. You step outside this Bible. You're wrong. See, I'm just showing you. Logos up here in John 1 and 1. <clears throat> He's speaking of the Elohim himself. Now, <clears throat> he said both, now when, when you are in a narrative, both the relation and the thing related of matter under discussion and affair, as in the case of the law and so on, you can call Logos. As, in other, because as signifying the inward thought, it denotes the, the faculty of thinking and reasoning, regard or consideration, reckoning, account, cause or reason. Now that's right found in that word. And John uses the word in a peculiar sense here, in verse 14, in this sense, in these two passages only, and that's where and let's, let's read that to you because it's the one concerning the Word made flesh. <clears throat> and here's your Trinitarians all messed up again. <clears throat> okay. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth. He's talking about the glory of the Logos coming through the Son. <clears throat> We'll get into more of this as time goes on and show you where we've all missed the boat. Wrong teaching. The American tradition is get all the money you can, have all you can, be a hog, kill, do what you want to do. There is no thought of God in the ways that people here. Our education is so putrid. Uh, and it's not because they took religion out of the schools. They could take prayer back in the schools. They can take religion back in the schools. They live a bunch of Trinitarian heretics and all go to hell anyway. <clears throat> what they're doing now is just a manifestation which, 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 which had to come, that's all. <laughs> Whether you had to in school or not. Why? Because the heart of everybody is, is full of nothing but money, money, money. The essentiality of the soul of man is nothing but money, the love of money. 
You can say what you want. You can say, well, the, the, the book of James was written to the Jews. That's fine. Who controls all the money today? The Jews. And don't think for a moment the Gentiles aren't just as anxious to have it as Jews are. <clears throat> and that's where the fight is going to be. And that's where the blood is going to be shed. That's why Hitler killed them. And that's why they'd be killed again. They're going to want what the Jews got. So if you want to be worldly gods, just get ready to kill all the Jews or anybody else. See, it's, it, it, it's, it, listen, this is what's going on now. <clears throat> so he's telling you here, <clears throat> this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's telling you that beginning is the beginnings before beginnings when there wasn't anything at that time until that beginning began. <clears throat> and they're going to throw this right onto the sun, and it won't work. It won't work from you that even the Trinitarian concept can't work. This Logos is what Brother Branham said. If you make Jesus God in John 1 and 1, under the conditions of which he was speaking and giving his doctrine, you end up with three gods. But you can quote him in 150 more places where Jesus is the Logos, but not that Logos. See? <clears throat> Here's where people, they, look, you've heard what I read, and this word logos cannot possibly refer to God under every condition. It just doesn't. But this is the one word that you can use to begin to see the beauty of it where omniscience, omnipotence work together in love and now is revealed or declared to us, which means that no matter when God comes on the scene, he still has to be explained. See, that's the thing where they miss Brother Branham, miss every prophet. Even when God comes on the scene, you say, that's God. Then shut up and listen to what the prophet says. What do you think he came on the scene for? Even the Catholics don't. Shut up and sit down. There's a message here. I said, Brother Branham preached that service, said, kept on saying they know better, they know better. One day I began saying, God, how do they know better? And then God got, I got Dave to get me some books. I want to know about this little uh, Fatima gal. So Dave got me the books, and there it was right there. And the priest that was narrating the whole thing, he said, what is this? He said, it wasn't a great manifestation out there. The thing was, God was saying, listen, I've got something to tell you. And tell me that Brother Brandon made a mistake when he said they know better. Oh, I, hallelujah, I get real religious right now. I'm ready about fighting. I may have a head that looks like a pin, but I'm no pinhead. <clears throat> All right. Now, the word here points directly to Genesis 1, where the act of creation is effected by God speaking. And you can find that in... Psalm 33 and 6, the idea of God who is, was in his own, who is his, who in his own nature hidden, revealing himself in creation is the root of the Logos idea. In contrast with all materialistic or pantheistic conceptions of creation. In other words, this man is saying here, it's just exactly what Paul said, you can know God by creation, but you can't really know him as to know him. But you can know positively he's there. And if you turn down that, that's the first step to complete obliteration and annihilation. God in nature. <clears throat> now, we go to the Logos concept because we do know you can see God in nature, there's a creator. But if you can't hear from him, if he doesn't express himself, his wisdom only shows forth his power doesn't explain it. How could you possibly believe in the love of God and the kind of God we believe in? He's got to come forth as Logos in everything. In other words, everything that lies in here that is in this great one God, loving spirit, omniscient, omnipotent, he's got to do something whereby he himself in it <coughs> manifests, <coughs> declares, helps us, to know him, whom to know right is life eternal. If you don't know him right, you haven't got life eternal. <clears throat> if you've got life eternal, you will know him right. So that's where Logos comes in. 
It goes beyond nature, because I can look at nature and say, oh, look at that. That's God in nature. And, and a hurricane come? And, and 2,700 people drown? Three billion dollars in damage? <clears throat> An earthquake come? 30,000 people killed? Billions of dollars in damage? So that's God in nature? Ah, give me a break. You'll never know God outside of his word. <clears throat> you can't do it. So therefore, the idea must come forth expressed, which is God must express himself. And he's got to be in it. And the beautiful thing is they don't want to believe God in the prophet. That God declared he would reveal himself again in human flesh. Oh, they can't take it. I love it. I get real religious. I'm not going to hang in the chandeliers either. I'm just going to scream up here a bit. I don't know. I, I, I see. We're different. <clears throat> We're different. From what I see in this word, we better be different. The word as embodying the divine will is personified in Hebrew poetry. That's true. You can see it. The word a healer, a messenger, the age of divine decrees, the personification of wisdom, <coughs> right down the line. You can see it. So here we find where Brother Branham said, this Bible is God in print. And that's all it is, God in print. <coughs> it, it is not God in action. It's God in print. But it can tell you who he is, what he does, how he does it, how you affect him, and that's true. How you af he affects you, which is truer still. <clears throat> Motives, everything. It's all out here in this book. And this reveals God by revealing Jesus Christ, who is the image who in turn, the Son is a Logos. If the, he is not a Logos, you tell me what he is. Well, he could be a chicken. Well, did God have an idea to have a chicken? No. The idea to have a horse? No. Had a son. Then the idea to have a son already was in God, capable to have a son, and he birthed his son. That's a Logos. Well, isn't it? <clears throat> Most certainly. That's what we're talking about. And that's why this word Logos becomes such a very, very good word. Now, there's many things I could read here which is very good, but I'm not going to take time <clears throat> to do it because it is not all that necessary and that pertinent. <clears throat> so what I wanted to get the idea here, when you go to John 1 and 1, it's absolutely lying there in the Greek. A beginning before all beginnings. As Brother Branham said, he comes before he comes. You say, oh, that was Brother Branham stuttering. Well, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't. I never took it for that. He said, he comes before he comes. And I say, that's exactly right. He comes before he comes, and he's talking about God. God comes before Jesus comes. And that's exactly true. And Jesus also comes before he comes because we meet him in the air. And he's got to get down here on earth to be a coming. So how was a prophet's language? Maybe 100% beautifully perfect. <clears throat> I take it to be that way. So all right, we're looking at Logos, and we're looking at what Brother Branham categorically said about John 1 and 1 concerning Jehovah Elohim. In the beginning, someone was there before anything started. That's what it's all about. Who was there before anything started? Just God. <clears throat> so that's exactly what we are talking about. Now, we can go from there, and this is one thing I just said I don't like to do, but we'll do it. I'm going to do some reading of some, some of Brother Branagh's quotes, and it's dangerous in the sense that you isolate some things, but if you read enough of them, you know, you can begin to see the, the formulation and the, uh, the tack <clears throat> the, the, you know, like the direction that things are going. So, all right. So, all right, we find Rogos is rightly used by John because we find God revealing or expressing himself and uh, in and through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and in so doing, all nine aspects of the memra 
come out into the open. <clears throat> and we saw that. We, we saw the fact that, of what Jesus did. And remember that he was in the likeness of, of Moses. Now, okay, so reading a bit here. To get back, to get on the other track, where we find Brother Branham talking about the Logos, talking about Jesus, talking about the halo of light, talking about uh, just different things. He talks about the theophany, and uh, he actually is not correct on the word theophany, but as the Bible always corrects the word, the word corrects the word, you'll find that he is corrected. And he's corrected it very nicely himself, God having corrected him. And remember, Brother Branham didn't need correction. There are people, when Brother Branham said he always had his doctrine right, that is true. But he had errors within the doctrine. For, for, for reason, Brother Branham knew the baptism with the Holy Ghost was a born-again experience. But he said the evidence was love, and it's not love. He had to be corrected. <clears throat> he's believing the word for the hour. Because that's what God said the Holy Ghost would do when he came. Well, if he does something else, he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my mind and not teach these people. I'm going to just fill them full of love. Well, you, well, that's wonderful. So then maybe you can, an act of love, you could go right against the will of Almighty God. Now let's talk about an act of love along that line just for the sake of it. The Bible distinctly said if a child is obstreperous and will not obey his parents and he's absolutely uh, a, a bad little kid, little devil, you bring him before the elders, they'll lay hands on him, and they'll kill him. Let not thine eyes spare. Don't let your heart tremble. Do it. Did they do it? No. When a man rapes a woman, he's supposed to be killed. And he should be killed. Even today. They used to do it. Why did they quit doing it? Why did David not do it? Oh, this is my son. Boys will be boys. Well, he had a daughter. Why didn't he protect her integrity? What well, Absalom got away with it. After Absalom got killed, he, he boo-hooed and belly ate, so they said, listen, you're crying more for that boy than for the kingdom. You are going to lose your head if you don't smarten up David. In other words, they said, you've got a false sympathy and a false thing going here. As king, you better smarten up. So you see, what if the Holy, what if God just said, okay, I'll give him all love. Where does love of God come in? What's true love toward each other? <clears throat> what about Brother Brown saying, how you ought to love each other, you ought to love this word. We're, like a, we're mostly like a bunch of tomcats with their tails tied together, thrown over a clothesline. <laughs> yeah, preachers especially. People ain't far behind. People like preacher, same spirit gets on them. <clears throat> you see, the, the evidence is, is, is knowing the word. And from there on, they'll come the actions. All right, so first, so he first was God, Jehovah. <clears throat> well, that's true. Actually, he was what Brother Brown has said in, in another place. He was El, Ella, Elohim. Let's just picture now as a little drama so you can get it. And this is said back in 1950 in Cleveland, Ohio. <clears throat> What's up in Cleveland? What's in Windsor? What's in Toledo? Death. Death everywhere. Why do you think certain places in America are going to get the bomb? Or bombs? <clears throat> Let's just picture now as a little drama so you can get it. Let's see coming out of space where there's nothing. Let's make it a little white light. Like a mystic light, like a halo. And that was the Logos that went out of God in the beginning. That was the Son of God that came out of the bosom of the Father. That was what was in the beginning, was the Word. The Word is with God, and the Word is God. Now, see, you can get fooled right here thinking that Brother Branham is not saying what he said previously. He's talking about God. And that's what happened in the beginning. God was there and nothing else was there. And the beginning was the birth of the Son. And that's the beginning of all beginnings. That was the beginning of the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was God. Now notice he's right back to what I'm trying to tell you. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was God. What came out of God? Logos. 
and then it became flesh. What became flesh? God became flesh. How did he become flesh? Through the Son. <clears throat> now watch. In the beginning was God. And then out of God came the Logos, a part of God that went out of God. Now see, Ronnie said, a part of God that went out of God, a Logos, he's talking about that light. So therefore, you see the idea perfectly expressed. I am to become a father. I want this son. He's very necessary to me. So he must be gotten in this very particular way. And when he comes forth, he's formed, and there's nothing to form out of except God himself, just like when a baby comes, when the sperm and the egg is there, there's nothing but the mother. That's all. And of course she has to eat and she has to be sustained and so on. <clears throat> but God doesn't have to eat and be sustained. So he gives birth to this son. That's a Logos. Because he wanted a son, a son is what he got, and the light was around him. There the exterior and the interior was perfect from the omniscient, omnipotent, loving God. <clears throat> we have the Son. Now, I'll skip a lot of these. And read here. Now, when these great lights went out, or great rays of spirit, love, peace, and so on, that was all there. There was no suffering. There was no hate, no malice. It couldn't come from this fountain. That was Jehovah. That was Jehovah God. And now, as the theologians call it, a theophany went from that, which was called in the scriptural the Logos, the Logos that went out of God, it's hard to explain was it, but it was a part of God. Now, very vaguely, you could make that a theophany <clears throat> on the very grounds that Jesus was nothing but a part of God. As the question came to Brother Branham, listen, what is the difference between God and Jesus? He said, no difference except sons have beginnings. So here we have now, we have God Almighty up here. And here is the great one before all the beginnings. Great before the beginnings. All right, now comes forth the sun. Here the sun. And he is in a light, up here a light. And he's actually a part of Almighty God, and he is a sun. Now, that has to be a Logos. <clears throat> That's all there is to him. And at the same time, because God, he's nothing but a part of God. That's all he is. That person right there is a chunk of God, a part of God. That's a theophany. But theophany and Logos are not really the same thing. Brother Banham equates the theophany to that which is a, a spirit form. And it is. But when you use the word theophany, you've got two words. Theo, theos, which is God, and phanero, which is to show forth. And, and in, a, in, a, in a sense, that is Jesus, and he does show forth God, absolutely. He has seen me as seen the Father. No, no problem. But you can't carry that all the way. <clears throat> you have to be very careful. But notice, it, 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 it's all right. Now here's what happened, excuse me. This just gets right where I love it, see, the Logos. And this great fountain, this great fountain of spirit, which had no beginning or no end, the great spirit began to form in the creation. And the Logos that went out from it was the Son of God. It was the only visible form that this spirit had. And it was a theophany, which means a body, the body like a man. Now, he go, the reason he says that is the following verse. And that's why he, so he's right in Scripture. Moses saw it when it passed by the rock. And as he looked at it, said, it looked like the hind part of a man, the back of a man is what the Scripture says. It's the same type of body that we receive when we die. <clears throat> now, the point is that is not a theophany. And Brother Branham corrected it by saying spirit or word form body. The word always corrects the word. Now, if you want to use the word theophany here, that is perfectly legitimate. On this grounds, now on this grounds, if we were a part of God, and we were, and we had gone directly to that word body, which we could have gone to, that would be actually a theophany in the sense that we were nothing but a part of God. And it would be like the prophets, gods, G-O-D-S, to whom the words come. As Brother Branham said, you're Messiahs. You're Miss Jesuses. In other words, we are looking at the lowering and the coming down of the line of the life of God. Now, these terms here are legitimate. The reason I myself 
prefer other terms is because I can be more definitive in what I say and hold my line. And I always like to teach by holding my line, and I don't say I always do. I do not like convolutions. They're dangerous. That's why a preacher or a speaker should never leave his notes or his idea to bypass it and think he can come back because he can get lost. I've been preaching about 60 years, and I don't think I've done that six times. That's a pretty big record, and that means one thing. God sure helped this pinhead of mine. I like straight, direct attacks <clears throat> when it comes to these things. But it's all right. Now watch. It's the same type of body that we receive when we die. Now notice he says type of body. Didn't say it was, but type. If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. That was, that was it. And that was the theophany, which was the Son of God. The Son, that Logos, became flesh because we were put in flesh. And the theophany, the Logos, became flesh here amongst us. And it was nothing else but the dwelling place, for that entire fountain dwelt in him. <clears throat> now, that might sound obtuse in certain ways, but, but there again, I'm back to what I said. You can say this. I don't like saying it. Not saying the prophet's wrong. But the fact is this. If we had gone direct to our body, which Jesus did, it would have been a spirit body. It would not have been a theophany body. It would have been a son body. But being the son is a part of God, it would have that which was required to be from that life of God. That's why Brother Branham said it's eternal in the heavens. It's waiting for you. And when you're born again, you've heard from your theophany because that's where you should have gone. But now born again, you have that which commensurate whereby you can be tested and live up to the expectations which were in you being in that word body. That's why you heard from it. And that's why it's eternal. Because <clears throat> it's a part, naturally, wouldn't that light that emanated from Jesus have to be eternal, coming from the eternal part? <clears throat> I would look at it that way. All right. Now, John first chapter, in the beginning was the word. Now, a word is a thought expressed. Now, you see, that's what I say, that's fine. But you can't leave it that flat because you're referring to God. So everything that lies within the natural concept of Logos, you have to bring back to God and you have to lift it up where it works. See, in the sense of begins to communicate to you what you need to know. Because remember, the only begotten Son absolutely declared him, which means brings him forth by word. Now, let's look at this Son here. This only begotten Son. He comes down here and is in human flesh. <clears throat> what happens? After he comes down at the River Jordan, we find God, Logos, comes into this Logos here. Now, Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus of the new. Now, not this flesh person <clears throat> that's the son, but this Jehovah of the old is Jesus of the new. So, we have to be very careful when we talk about Jesus. Yeah, because this in the flesh came in his father's name, but he wasn't the father, period. He's the son. And the father who created that cell and egg that in which God wrapped himself to bring forth what God's own flesh would have brought forth had he himself done it instead of through Jesus, those trays would be in there, as Brother Branham said, he took your great-great-great-grandmother, great-great-great-grandfather, down, down, down to get you. And so God did it to get this. Then he came in here temporarily to the Garden of Gethsemane. And remember, after Gethsemane, when God left him 
and Peter cut off the high priest's ear, <clears throat> and the people were fussing, and Jesus said, Whom do you come and seek? And they said, Jesus, now he said, I am, and they fell backward, and people tried to make that Godhead. Not so. Not so. <clears throat> because he was before Abraham, and he was there. See, you've got to keep this careful. Jesus of the old is the, of Jehovah the old is Jesus the new. <clears throat> so, I want you to keep that in mind. I, I just suddenly remembered I hadn't brought that to your attention, and I certainly had wanted to, <clears throat> because here's pitfalls. If you don't realize that, Jehovah of the old is the Jesus of the new. So, therefore, every, all of this, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Jehovah, complex lay in him. Fullness of the Godhead bodily, but show me where he was omniscient or omnipotent. Show me where he could, ha that he had his own will and it was right in doing it. He said, spare this from me, O Lord, but if the cup can't pass away, thy will be done. I come to do thy will, O God. <clears throat> See, he not God, son of God. <clears throat> so, now, now a word is a thought expressed. It's a thought first. You think it, then you speak it. And he was the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And the word is made flesh and dwell among us. Is that right? In the very beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word God. <clears throat> now, that word with, of course, we understand uh, I don't know if I got it written down here or not. I mean, I got it from this, these articles. No, I didn't. Uh, I guess I didn't copy that part. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> the word with, as, as I mentioned before, it, um, it has to do uh, with the thought. It denotes motion toward or direction, not merely in the sense of being near or beside, but as a living union implying the act of motion of intercourse. In other words, God is a rima logos. There's no way that God can act apart from his word. No way, whatever. And that's why he is the word. And he's not just the word on the grounds of the manifestation. He's, he's the word on the ground that the manifestation is based upon this, <clears throat> which you could call a rima. In other words, it's written in stone. And then what's written in stone is manifested in a vessel. And everything in the Jehovah complex, you see right here, comes out in Jesus. <clears throat> so what did God pour into the fullness that God had bodily? And then Jesus poured what he was into the church, which is complete redemption and all of these things coming through it. <clears throat> Look at what he was, and then see what was poured into the church. He was the complete Son of God, the only begotten. Did he pour that in the church? He sure did. He gave himself for it. His spirit was a God's. What did he do? He gave that to the church. And Brother Brandon said he, <clears throat> he, it, 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 he poured his soul out. He does say he's poured his soul and it. <clears throat> Many things. Now, here. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word. Because it was his thought before he expressed it, it was God. When he expressed it, it became God because the word is a part of God. Just like you are a part of your word. And when he expressed it, it became God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. <clears throat> of course, it doesn't quite say that. But that's the idea in there. You can read it, I read it yourself, and it says that. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, it tells you they're flat. There's only one that could have had that. Only one, and that was the Son. No one else could have had that glory. No one else could have shared it. No one else could, could say, the Father dwells in me. I and my Father in one. No one else could say, all my thoughts are of God. I don't do a thing unless I see him do it. I never say anything unless I hear it. Right? There's nobody else could say that. Nobody, 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 nobody. No, the only perfect one. <clears throat> and even he learned to beat his by suffering. Many things in here you have to watch. Now, if he was the word then, expressed and manifested word, then he'd have to be the same thing tonight, because when God speaks, he can never take it back. See, that's the way you must have confidence in your Bible. 
Your Bible is this. God wrote on paper in word form because it is God. In other words, he gave us a complete photograph, you might say. <clears throat> Put himself in black and, ink, black and white. Even the Old Testament, the Bible said, was that the word came, God came to the prophets. The prophets, the word of God came to them. Now, th that's why Brother Branham said, and this is something nobody really wants to believe, but, but guys like you and me, and that he said, the prophet is the living word of God made manifest. Right, Joe? And Brother Branham said, that when Mr. Rosinke couldn't take, could he? And Johnny Rowe, sorry to mention their names, but they thought it was blasphemy, utter blasphemy. So Joe said, look, I just quoted Joe and gave him that day. What is that about the, uh, I forget what it's out of. It might be the future home of the earthly bride. The prophet is the living word of God made manifest. They said, blasphemy, blasphemy. So Joe said, hey, just a minute, here's my book. They say, well, people are still saying it. Huh? I say, now there's two of them. Huh? Leave you up preaching two gods. Huh? And I'm quoting Brother Branham. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know something? Live with it. Live like women live with their long hair. Live with the word. <clears throat> okay. Now in the beginning was the word. The word is made flesh and dwelt among us. The three stages. It was an attribute first was in God that he thought of himself as being human. And that transmitted him down to be Jesus. Now, if you'll ever be there, you were with him then. And there's only one form of eternal life, that's God. And you had to be a part of God at the beginning. It's not what you just chose down here. He chose you. All the Father has given me will come. <clears throat> now, that's a good thought right in here when we look at this. Now, let me go into again. Three states. It was an attribute first was in God that he thought of himself as being human, and that transmitted him down to Jesus. Now, let's look at that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God. Now, if you put this into human figure, in the beginning was the Word, Almighty God, the great fountainhead Word. Now, it was with God. Bring that to yourself. Part of God, you were with him, in him, and coming down. See, but it's still God. He's not talking here about Jesus in John 1 and 1 in the case of Godhead. And we saw that right from the Greek. <clears throat> Brother Branham, see, every time you're going to find him right on the Word, I don't care how you look, you're going to find him on the Word. Now, I know preachers aren't going to agree with me, but I agree with myself. Yeah. And I know what I'm talking about. If they do, that's fine. No problem. Let them talk what they know. I talk what I know. And I know there's one God. And Jesus is not God, period. He's the Son of God. And I know exactly how he came. I know what kind of body he's got. And that's exactly I teach this way because one day there are going to be people just sitting here healed in your seats. You know why? Because we've got three, two out of the three right now. If there are three. Number one is... If you only knew who I was, you'd all be healed. We know that. We know Brother Branham, living word of God made manifest. We know Jehovah Elohim right there. We understand perfectly. And we understand Jesus the old is of the Jehovah the old is Jesus the new. And we know that Jesus is here right now in the form of a pillar of fire. He brought that word. He's here right now to raise the dead. The next thing he said, if you understood the virgin birth, you, you, your blind eyes be open. Is there a third thing? I don't know. But I'm telling you, brother, sister, we got to believe this word. You'll be healed sitting in your seats. I haven't stopped praying for the sick. Don't all lay hands on the sick. But Brother Branham said, that's not our time. Uh, he did it. I'm willing to do it. Any way for people to get help. But I'm looking by the grace of God for this word to be fulfilled. And I, I, it's going to be fulfilled somewhere. Like Brother Branham said, if we're not bride, there's a bride out there somewhere. And by the grace of God, it won't stand in our way. <clears throat> that's a beautiful thing to sing. How many of us can say that's a different story? All right, let's go a little further here. And now, what was that other question? I get so wound up in these, I forget what things they were. What was I, the son of man? The son of man or the pillar of fire? No, 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 he said. No, the pillar of fire is the anointing. I really maybe shouldn't read that at this point here. Let me, let me, because that'll come up again at another time. Well, I can. <clears throat> the pillar of fire is the anointing, the pillar of fire. Now, this may go a little deep unless some of you are theologians. And some of these ministers sitting here, like my good friends around, they probably know. Now, that pillar of fire is the Logos that went out of God. The Logos, which is actually the attribute of the fullness of God. When God became into the form to where it could be seen, it really should be, he could be seen. It was the anointing of the great spirit that went forth, condescending, coming down. God the Father, the Logos. 
That's John 101, right? That was up over Israel. In other words, he's telling you God was in that Logos, and that's exactly what it should be. <clears throat> or it couldn't be otherwise. And that's the only word that fits now in the, in the modern language. The memory won't do it. That's just a static thing. We're looking at life and reality. We're looking at actually what God is right today. The same one in the pillar of fire came down. That's Logos right there. There had to be blood offering right in Eden. Then that Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt in a, no, I said dwelt in a human body. Didn't say he was born, said he dwelt in the body. Which was a sacrifice. But that one's okay. So the Bible is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> That's good, see? Everything he poured into Jesus. And at the same time, remember, pouring into Jesus, like Brother Branham said, not like he vomited up or tore off an arm and leg, but a mask. So what happened? This one here, all the attributes he wanted to express, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, coming right down here to this one here. <clears throat> Jehovah the old Jesus the new, fullness of the Godhead bodily. So therefore, when it's all summed up and you get all of this revealed and coming here, you now have the whole Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And at the same time, it's a revelation of this one here because Jehovah of the old is Jesus of the new. And remember, Jesus of the new is Christ, the anointed one. It's also the same word for Messiah. It's also the same word for Holy Spirit. So that's where you get caught up in these things that are difficult. I don't pretend I got the answer. But I got to stay with that word and see what Brother Branham said and bring it down every single time. And you cannot make Jesus God. Except where Brother Branham said he's God, but he's not God. <clears throat> All right, number one. When is he God but not God? Well, he never was God. He was the son of God, and God dwelt in him. And as a prophet, he was God to the people. And because God was in him, he was God. But not now. See? But I can worship him. That's true, because he's Lord. Sarah worshipped Abraham. Called him Lord. We do the same thing. There's lots of lords, you know. There's, that's, that's, a, that, that's an indication of, of power and authority due to uh, accepted stewardship and proven stewardship. <clears throat> so the Bible is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ, Jehovah Elohim, <clears throat> brought through the Son in this day. God in sundry times spoke by the, uh, in the prophets, and last day speaks through his Son, Jesus Christ. So there it is. Everything that was, he's the complete rever word revealed. Jesus was Malachi, Jesus was Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah, all of them. They, and all they, they were, were in him. And all that you are, and all that I am, is in him. <clears throat> Words. Witnesses of the Word. So it's not a book of systems, a code of moral ethics. Neither is it a history book, a book of theology. It is not. And yet, in a word, it is. It's all there. But it's the revelation of Jesus Christ in every bit of it. And so you'll find, therefore, what God put forth to the people and gave them the opportunity. That's in the Bible. What they did with that and how they did it, that's in the Bible. And how God responded to that, that's in the Bible. And where God effected his cures or wanted his cures, that's in the Bible. What God did as an antidote, that is in the Bible. What God brought judgment. So you see, everything that Brother Branham said is actually not true, but true. It's all there, but it's all a revelation. It's all a revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, God himself revealed from word to flesh. Now, what does he call that? The revelation of Jesus Christ? He's right back to Jehovah the Old, Jesus the New. <clears throat> revealed from word to flesh. That's what it is. The Bible is the word. And, and then he has God as the flesh, but that's, he, he didn't mean that. God is the word, rather, and Jesus being the flesh. It's a revelation how God the word, right back to John 1 and 1, was manifested in human flesh and revealed to us. And that's why he becomes a son of God. He is a part of God. You understand. So therefore, Jesus was a part of God and proven by the fact that God indwelt him. And the same thing is today. If you are seed, you will receive the Holy Ghost. And if you have received the Holy Ghost, you'll believe this message. You see, you can't do otherwise. You can't back off the word that Brother Branham taught. I realize that in the eyes of many people, I am doing a dance and a little convoluting. But I don't care what they believe. 
because I know where I stand and I know what's being said. The body is a part of God so much that it's a son. Isn't that beautiful? Well, that's true. We told you how he got born. As the Catholic put it, eternal son. The rest of the churches, the word don't even make sense. See, there cannot be eternal and then be a son because the son is something that's begotten from. The word eternal cannot be. He can be a son, but he can't be eternal son. No, sir, cannot be eternal son. But now he's the son of God so much that all the word that was in Jeremiah and Moses, all those words he said, they speak of me. That's, a, that's right, that's the Bible. All that true divine revelation of word was wound up into one body and God put flesh around it. Well, that's true. You put it a different way. That's the reason he was called son. The reason he refers father, why? It's just as simple. If you just let God pour it down your mind, see, God revealed in a body of flesh, notice, revealed from flesh, or word unto flesh, that's John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You see, Brother Branham never ever deviates from the fact that John 1 and 1 absolutely literally is God Almighty. And he came down and indwelt human flesh that Jehovah of the old was Jesus of the new. And we're talking now of the God within the man because Jesus is not God. It was a duality as Brother Branham said. It was the Son of God begotten in such a way no other one. And he, he had the fullness of the Godhead. God himself absolutely as a person indwelt him. That made Emmanuel God with us. <clears throat> All right, that's as far as we'll go. So I hope you begin to see that there is a thread here. And that thread is inviolable. You can't violate it. <clears throat> it goes all the way through. Father and son and children. And we've explained it. All right, tomorrow if we have the ability wherewithal to get back, we shall be back. It's getting to the point where I'm getting uh, not just a few days behind, I'm getting months behind and time is running out in me so fast. I figure you people are coming every two weeks instead of four weeks and I'm wondering when you're going to make it once a week. That's the way time's going these days, <clears throat> so it's very tiring. All right, let's bow our heads for a second. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time of fellowship we've had. And now as we go, Lord, to look at your word a little tiny bit and have foot washing and communion, Lord, we praise you that we're able to do this, knowing, O oh God, that you have made the way for us. And therefore, Lord, we are anxious to be participants therein, knowing, Father, that it's been, it is required of us and such an easy requirement, such a blessing. Help us now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.